This conference will now be recorded. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll, because of the challenges that many of us have got uh, from working at home, I'm actually working out of my garden shed at the moment, um, which doesn't have Wi-Fi connection. It's uh, working from a, um, a dongle that I plug into the side of my laptop. Um, and I'm also using my iPad. So, so the presentation and my voice is going to be through uh, my iPad. And Colin is going to page turn for me because I've previously shared my presentation with Colin. So it will be like uh, Chris Whitty um, at the National COVID briefings where Chris Whitty says, next slide, please. And um, whoever behind the scenes turns the slides over will do that. And Colin can do that helpfully for me today. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. The presentation of Colin just said is on the geotechnical app geotechnical asset management of the rail network in Kent, uh, White Cliffs, Rain, 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 and Getting Ahead of the First Crisis. Uh, and just to explain the title a little bit more, I don't need to explain a bit about geotechnical asset management of rail network in Kent, but the easy bit. Um, the White Cliffs, Rain, 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 and Getting Ahead of the First Crisis is reference to um, the fact that um, we had some struggles during the winter, um, as many of you will um, uh, have experienced because you work for Network Rail as well. Um, primarily due to the very heavy rain that we experienced um, from about this time last year to um, pretty much the first week in March 2020. Um, and it was constant rain. Um, we've, we all experienced it, didn't we? Um, it, it not only rained, it rained and it rained and it didn't seem to ever stop. And actually it was um, it was then quite widely advertised as one of the wettest winters on record, um, and also I think that's February was the wettest February ever. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the the impact of that rain. Um, the reference to getting ahead of the first crisis is because we we had that crisis, the weather crisis, but then obviously we went into the COVID crisis quite nicely. Um, what it wasn't particularly nice was it because um, it felt like that we needed a rest. In actual fact, we then went straight into another crisis to manage. Well, we had to rewrite our standards and, and it completely upset all of our work and we all ended up having to work from home. So um, that's the reference to getting ahead of the first crisis. And, and for those of you that know me, you know that I quite often talk about folks from Warren. Well, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to talk about the white test and folks from Warren today. Um, but I am going to show you quite a lot of, um, of good photos that hopefully will interest you. Um, if you move on to the next slide, please, uh, Colin, slide number two, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the contents of the presentation. <laughs> you might need to use your left and right clicker on your keypad if, you're, um, if you can't find the left or right button on the PowerPoint yeah, presentation. No. I am clicking right, but we are not going. Right, which is an interesting one. So just bear with me a second. Hmm. Try your down arrow on the key. Oh. Perfect. Thank you, whoever changed that. Um, so the presentation is split up into three aspects. Uh, a bit of an introduction to uh, geotechnical asset management in, in Network Rail. I'm then going to talk to you about um, the wet winter that we had. And then actually I'm going to talk to you a bit about the dry summer we had, because it's amazing, isn't it, how the weather completely changes from one uh, weather type to another, but we went from a very, very wet winter to a very, very dry summer. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, how that impacts on earthworks as well. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we can start to cope with these ever-changing weather events and climate change. And I was interested to know that you did have a presentation coming up in the next couple of weeks about weather resilience and climate change as well. So um, I'll definitely be dialing into that. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Colin. And there's one after that as well with the picture.
of the rocket crossing Chat Moss in 1830. So this is a um, quite an old picture, quite a lovely picture that shows Chat Moss um, and the embankment that was built on brushwood faggots, which are bundles of um, sticks um, that the um, or the pre-Victorian engineers uh, built the Liverpool to Manchester line um, on over Chat Moss. Uh, that piece of embankment is still used by um, modern trains. Um, but as you can see, um, that that pretty much is uh, the very first embankment that was built um, with a uh, railway on it. Obviously, the um, Stockton to Darlington railway was the oldest, but I think this is the next oldest. Dates back to 1830, which makes it 190 years old. And there aren't many rail assets that are 190 years old, bar a few uh, bridges. Uh, makes it quite challenging to look after earthworks when they're that old. And move on to the next slide, please. And I'll explain how Victorian earthworks were built. Um, so you can see some pictures there of uh, an embankment in the top left hand corner. Um, and as you can see, that embankment is actually being built um, across a cornfield, it looks like. Um, but certainly, what they're doing is they're uh, end tipping, what we call end tipping the um, excavated material, probably from a cutting or from a tunnel, using a temporary piece of track. Um, and there is no compaction going on at all with that material. Um, it is tipped out of a truck um, down the side of the of the slope. It would have been then scraped into some sort of temporary batter, um, and then it would have compacted over um, the next few years. Um, and they would have tried to run trains on it almost immediately. Um, and you can just imagine what the pressure on which you would have been like on an embankment like that with it settling. Um, certainly not to any modern day standard. Um, on the right hand picture, you'll see a steam shovel. Um, so these are um, Victorian excavators that would have used a, a steam engine to power the um, mechanical workings of that excavator. The material would have been excavated out of a cutting like that and then presumably dumped into trucks to take along to the next embankment, trying to um, create some sort of cut fill balance. And the picture underneath shows um, uh, a, a very newly formed cutting. It looks pretty good there, doesn't it? But I can tell you that that cutting is over steep and it's probably going to be failing within 20 to 30 years um, and, and will be certainly causing a cause for concern now. And the other thing that you'll see on that cutting base is that there isn't any vegetation at all, um, which of course there is on quite a few of our railway cuttings now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we often get beaten up as earthworks engineers because um, I think I think some of our um, quite high level individuals within that rail feel that we should look after earthworks better. Um, we get criticised quite a lot when we cause disruption. Um, and you'll have seen the um, the terrible tragedy that occurred at Stonehaven um, a few weeks back. Um, I think it's it's helpful just to look back in history and just um, look back to see that uh, landslips are, are happened previously and they happen still. Um, and that's not through fault of the individuals that look after them. It's part of it is due to the legacy that we've picked up on. Um, particularly around their construction, which I've just explained. Um, and some of the um, understanding of, of geology, soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering at that particular time. Um, and it's not something that we can just undo because we can't rebuild those Victorian earthworks. So I thought I'd just show you this quite interesting article from, from the London Times um, from Tuesday, January the 7th, 1930. So that's uh, 90 years ago. Um, and I'll read some of it out because it's really, really quite interesting. Um, and it's, it's a good one not to just uh, quickly skim through. Um, so it talks about a landslip on train, the usual sensational newspaper headline. Carriages partly buried, cliff fall near the main line. And it goes on to say landslips caused by recent gales and heavy rains were reported yesterday from different parts of the country. Uh, near Waterhurst and Paul Furnival, um, will know this particular location very well because it's either side of Wadhurst Tunnel. Um, and I know Paul's on the line at the moment. So it says, near Wadhurst on the main line to Hastings, 
earth from the high embankment, actually it's a cutting, so they got the terminology wrong, but never mind, fell on part of a train whilst in, uh, without injuring anyone. And the passengers walking through to the front carriages and continuing their journey in them. And it goes on to talk about uh, Timberdine um, and Newport as well having had issues. But I'll just read out the more detailed extract about water um, in the middle column. It says the train was partly buried by the five, I don't know whether that's 550 or 505, from Hastings to London, when it was near Wadhurst Tunnel between Wadhurst and Tyfest Road. So Tyfest Road station is now called Stonegate. Um, so it's between Wadhurst and Stonegate Station. A large quantity of earth fell from the high embankment, should be cutting, onto and about the rear coaches, but without derailing them. The passengers in those coaches walked through the corridors to the front part of the train, which was detached and went on to Tunbridge Wells, about eight miles away, arriving there one hour and 40 minutes late. So that's pretty good, isn't it, in terms of um, current delays that get experienced by earthworks failures. The landslip completely blocked the upline and the single line traffic had to be worked. A Southern Railway official late last night said that it was hoped to release the train and clear the line by midnight. And I don't know whether we'd be able to do that these days. We might get some response out there, but I'm sure we wouldn't be able to excavate a train out um, in, in, in a very short amount of time, seven hours ago. Uh, the full facts of the accident have not yet been ascertained, but it appears that the train was pulled up when the driver saw that the quantity of earth and bushes had fallen onto the line. And it was whilst the train was stationary that the more serious fall occurred. This fouled the rear coaches and made it necessary to detach them from the rest of the train. Operations to release the coaches were at once begun, and we hope to have normal services running tomorrow morning. So that's pretty pretty quick turnaround, isn't it, in terms of um, uh, perhaps making, making the cutting safe and getting the line cleared of material and getting the train out and getting the line back open again. Um, certainly something we can aspire to these days, though you think that our contractors turn around but it is quite quickly. Um, but I think that's pretty impressive. Um, rather ironically, on the next page of that 1930 edition, but, so the re one of the reasons why I'm showing you this is because we still have problems at Wadhurst Tunnel with the cutting either side of it. But we also have problems at Dawlish Warren as well. And it's, Interesting to note that in 1930, they were having problems there as well. And it says, aided by fine weather and comparatively calm sea, the workmen engaged in repairing the damaged seawall on the Great Western Railway between Dawlish and Dawlish Warren and made good progress yesterday. Between tides, the beach, uh, between tides, the breach in the wall was filled with large granite blocks. And underneath the track where the subsidence occurred, um, a start was made with the erection of granite support. If favourable conditions continue, it is hoped that the line will be reopened and normal services resumed in three days. So you'll remember the track hanging in the air at Dawlish Warren back in 2014. Um, it made national news. Um, that was 2014, many of you will remember, was a really um, awful year for landslides in Kent and Sussex as well. Um, so the purpose of showing you that slide is that um, landslips, earthquakes, failures, uh, sea defence issues have been around for a number of years and will probably continue to be around. So um, we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much when, when we see the next landscape and have to deal with it. Um, the most important thing is to get the line open as quickly as possible and to make it um, as safe as possible to prevent it from happening again. Um, next slide, please, Colin. And the next slide after that as well. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the weather challenges we had in 2019 um, and moving into 2020. Um, so that date on that slide is wrong, that should actually say March 2020. Um, so you can see there the uh, number of failures that we had in Kent and Sussex Group. Um, uh, there were over 50 um, between uh, November and March. Uh, the ones in bold show where lines were closed. Uh, many of you will be, have been involved with those particular locations. Um, in Sussex Group, uh, you'll remember the big embankment failure at Cookspond Viaduct, which is just north of East Grinstead, um, and also some of the issues that we had around Holmwoods on the uh, Horsham Stalking railway line. Um, and in Kent, uh, you remember the track hanging in the air at Eden Bridge Embankment, that was the picture on the uh, title page of the presentation. Uh, we also had a quite significant cutting failure at Cuxton on the Paddock Wood Strood line. Um, uh, uh, landslip in the Wadhurst Clay at Summerhill Tunnel, 
um, another one just south of Woodhurst at Grag Oak Cutting, um, and others as well that cause ESR um, emergency food restriction. Um, and that was the status as in March 2020. Um, so you'll see that uh, that, that winter with uh, what I call the, the winter of discontent um, caused a number of lines to be closed and a number of food restrictions to be placed on, on, on a railway line, which obviously did delay their customers. Um, so next slide, please, Colin. Um, this map shows, wait for it to come up on the screen. I'll talk through the map before it comes up onto the screen. Um, the map shows uh, the locations of the main failures. Um, so the service affecting failures are in red, other landscapes are in orange. It doesn't show the location of all of those 50. And I think that the main point in showing you this is that there, there is no trend in terms of either lines or location of those failures. I think some people sometimes think that um, particular uh, depot locations or lines are more more impacted. And certainly, there's some truth to that. The Cambridge to Hastings line just tend to suffer more earthworks failures. Um, so this is all about geology and rainfall, um, and some of it's about um, earthworks age. Um, you can see there that um, earthworks failures can be quite disruptive to the whole of the whole of the route and region. Um, so just because you have a lot of failures in Kent. Uh, doesn't mean you won't get, the, get any in Sussex or Wessex. They tend to scatter out throughout the region. Um, some of that is due to the way that the weather hits the um, southern region, and it generally comes across from the west to the east. Um, we generally find that in East Kent there are, there are less failures. The sort of um, Canterbury eastward, particularly because the rain generally is run out by the time it gets to East Kent, and but the geology is slightly better. But certainly in the high wheels, the geology is poor. Um, uh, moving around to the London Basin, where there's quite a lot of London clay, uh, and down into the West Country as well. Certainly, they're, they're quite their locations that can be quite affected by earthquake failures. Uh, next slide, please, Colin. Uh, this slide shows a little bit more detail. Um, so, I'm going to go into a lot more detail about Edenbridge failure because it's quite an interesting one in terms of how it was recovered. Um, but I'm also going to uh, tell you a bit about uh, Cuxton as well. So, uh, the top Top slide shows a couple of pictures of Edenbridge. Um, this happened on the 22nd of December. Um, remember it very well. Remember receiving the call from Paul Furnival. Um, then disrupted both of our Christmases, um, just purely because um, it was quite a sizable failure. We had to close the line. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we uh, stabilised it and uh, reopened it in, um, in late February, early March. Um, Cuxton is, a, is an example of a cutting failure. So, as I said, Cuxton is on the paddock with the screwed line. Uh, happened around a similar sort of time, two days earlier than Edenbridge. Um, but yet, we were able to reopen the line relatively quickly. Uh, we tend to do that by uh, creating what we call ballast bag walls. Uh, you can see it in the picture on the right hand side, um, whereby we construct a, a castellated wall of ballast, one ton uh, ballast bag. Uh, these are brought in by road rail vehicles from a nearby access point. Um, it's not, not particularly designed. Um, there are some rules of thumb around how high you can go um, and, and how vertical you can place those uh, ballast bags. Uh, but the main thing is to get the line back open again to remove the material from the track, which you can see has covered it. Um, we tend to reopen with a with a very low speed restriction, so either a five miles an hour or 20 miles an hour in this particular case, uh, until we can stabilise the slope permanently, and the and the permanent solution will need to have ground investigation and design, uh, which can take six nine months to do, um, and then that that location then had a pile of wall built at the toe of the cutting. Um, interestingly enough, that location failed not only because of the um, the wet weather at the time, but also because it had a car wash at the crest of the cutting. Um, if you know that road that goes up from the M20 junction up to the M2, you'll know that there's a car wash garage on the right-hand side as you go north. Um, and that car wash, we believe, 
um, had some leaky drains and leaky taps. Um, and that constant dripping of water, taps and drains into a slope, even during the summer, would have had a, had a, um, an artificially high groundwater level. Um, so that when the rain came in the winter time, it would have just tipped it over the edge. And that is why that particular location failed rather than any others on that particular cutting. Sometimes you get those little triggers with the curve that cause failures like a block drain um, that can just trigger that particular location rather than any others. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is quite a complex slide. Um, which I put together for Andrew Haynes when he came out to Eden Bridge to see what was going on. So, so we've called it Godston Crowhurst there. Initially, no one, no one knew where Godston and Crowhurst was, so we had to rename it to, to Eden Bridge to, to make it a little bit more descriptive. Um, on, the, on the plan, you can see three lines. Um, one of them is now closed, but you can see that the, um, the line going north-south is the East Grinstead line, so that's in Sussex Street. The line going east-west is the Red Hills Tunbridge line, um, and there is also a, a loop line um, that used to join the two together. Uh, the embankment is still there, but the track has been removed, and um, it's completely covered with trees and overgrown. Uh, Network Rail does still own it, um, but what it meant was the location that you can see, where it, which is marked failure, uh, which has the yellow bubble around it, it meant that getting access to that particular location to fix the failure where the track was hanging in the air was incredibly difficult. So how would we get to it? Um, could we go underneath the, um, the East Grinstead line? Um, could we bring in material along the Red Hills of Tunbridge line and perhaps drop it off at the bottom of the slope? Um, could we cut a hole in the Crowhurst loop line um, and come in from a Caterfield lane uh, where those arrows are shown? Um, so these are the sorts of discussions that take place within the first couple of days um, as to how we're actually going to get access. So that, so that actually the, the preferred way initially was to come in from Caterfield Lane along the side, along the downside of the Red Hill to Cumbers Line, cut a hole in the Crowhurst loop line because it was closed, so not too much of a problem. Build a temporary bridge, uh, where it says temporary bridge, and then start piling uh, the area where it says failure. So we'd either, we would either pile it or we'd raise it. Um, but either way, we would need to get some quite significant amounts of plant, um, construct a road, because obviously if you're regrading an embankment, you need to bring in all the fill material um, and bring in all the, all the um, piles or um, all the material as well. Um, you would also need to excavate out all of the, all of the um, fill material to ensure that all the poor quality material is gone before you put that. Um, new material. Um, very quickly, we realised that that would take about two to three weeks just to create that um, access route. So that would be taking out the old embankment and rebuilding the bridge. Um, but um, so that was that was going to be too long because it's three weeks to get in, three weeks to get out, and potentially two or three weeks to rebuild the embankment, which um, seemed to be too long. Um, so in actual fact, what we what we did in the end, um, and you'll see it on an aerial photograph in a minute, um, we we cut a hole um, in the upside. Um, it's in the area where which is marked as phase one. Um, so we cut a small hole to enable us to get into the um, the area which had failed. Um, that meant that we had to take the track out on the upside as well. So we cut. Um, cut quite a significant stretch of track out on the upside. The downside track was obviously hanging in the air, so it had to be removed anyway. Um, and that allowed us to start rebuilding the downside. Um, and then the last thing we obviously had to do was replug that hole in the upside. It, it, it meant that the area that's marked site office, we could create ourselves a nice site office. It meant that the, um, the access to that site office could be from Taterfield Lane. Um, it meant that we didn't need to build any bridges over uh, over the river, River Eden, which at that time was um, prone to flooding. And actually, it did flood um, in February in that West February on record that I mentioned. Um, and if you move on to the next slide, please, Colin, and um, you'll see how that looks in in reality. So this is an aerial photo that was taken by the BBC, um, who came out and uh, kindly 
um, interviewed some people and um, put some news coverage out. There was the River Eden on the left-hand side, so that was where we would have had to build the temporary bridge. Um, you'll see um, the hole that was cut in into the embankment on the um, on the upside. Um, you'll see some sort of bridge structure that spans across that gap, and that's actually some cables, uh, telecom cables that went to an MOD um, centre. So those couldn't actually be removed at all, unfortunately. So we had to put in a cable bridge to span those cables across the gap. Um, and then what you can see there is a constant supply of of stone which was brought in by 30 trains um, about two or three a week came in uh, from Hu Junction uh, bringing in ballast uh, so this was clean um, recycled ballast uh, loaded loaded at Hu Junction uh, brought down by top and tail class 66s um, they were taken off the main line at Edenbridge which we, we closed the line at Edenbridge station taken into this possession um, the material was then excavated out using those two RRVs with their low loaders. So they took it out of the wagons into those low loaders and then took it out of the wagons um, onto the slope. And then another excavator, you can see they're loaded it into those, all those little dump trucks. And then the dump trucks would run underneath the cable bridge uh, around to the other side, tipped out, and then that material was moved into place um, very gradually and, and uh, compacted using that roller that you can see there as well. Um, obviously, in advance of that, all of the material, all of the clay slip material had to be dug out and benched in. As you can see there, the nice benches in the, in the wheeled clay. Um, that material is um, in that big stockpile you can see in the top left-hand corner. So you have to take out the clay material first of all, and then bring in the recycled ballast. Um, that took a good two months to do. Um, and um, the good news was that we actually managed to reopen the railway line two weeks early. Um, we had some contingency built in. Um, the, the, actually, the easy part was, was uh, rebuilding the track because obviously we'd taken out quite a significant amount of tracks there. Um, and that all had to be put back in for the sheer textile, the ballast, um, the sleepers and rails, all the third rail, all the cables, all had to be reconnected, um, which, took, which took a good week on its own just to do the. Uh, rails and sleepers and, and track formation. Um, the, the, once the system was set up, it wasn't too difficult to do. It was just train in, tip out, move material around, compact. Um, so so once, once we got a plan, we were able to, to do it quite easily. But um, you can see the logistics of some of the failures, not only in terms of um, access, um, the logistics of ordering 30 trains, um, getting all the people there. We then had the COVID pandemic in March as well, just as we finished, but um, they still had to do some other work, so that impacted further on the work. Um, we, we also had some issues with protected species as well, which we won't go into, but uh, we found great protected mutes on site, which meant that we had to um, do some clever stuff around the uh, Wildlife and Countryside Act as well, and the police and natural England to make sure that we carried on on plan. Uh, move on to the next slide, please, Colin. Um, so this one shows you the reasons why we had so many earthworks failures in that particular period. So uh, it shows four different plots, one for October, November, December, and January. Um, so you can see there in October 2019, um, white shows roughly normal uh, rainfall um, on the map. Um, a lighter blue shows um, about one and a half um, and a darker blue in the scale on the right hand side shows just over two times the uh, average uh, average rainfall that you would expect in that particular month. So you can see in October we had between 0.75 and 1.5 um, across Kent, Sussex and Wessex. In November we had, it was quite a wet November, 0.75 to 2, um, an average of about 1.3 times normal. December we had between 1.25 and 2. So quite a wet December, and that was what, obviously what caused the failures at uh, Tuxton and Edenbridge. January was actually quite dry. Um, so you can see that January was drier than average um, in some parts of, of Kent and Sussex. Um, but when you added up all of that amount of rainfall, it was an average of five months worth of rain in four, and maximum of about 6.75 months of rain in four months. 
Um, so not only did we get a lot of rain over a long period of time, uh, we also got um, a significant amount of rain very quickly. So in the five days preceding uh, 22nd of December, we, ha we had 90 millimetres of rain. Um, and in the 15 days preceding that failure at Edenbridge, we actually had 155 millimetres of rain. And when 70 millimetres of rain is one month's worth of rain, and that's about two months worth of rain in 15 days. So that's a significant amount of rain um, for us to be able to cope with. Um, and when I say they're SMD for all squares to zero since November, when you get a lot of rain falling on saturated soil, um, that is the toxic mix that causes earthquake failure. And move on to the next slide, please. Oh yeah, so actually, um, uh, you will see there that that little banner came up. Then we had the wettest February on record, and the next slide tells you about this wettest February on record. So we move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I talked about um, seven months worth of rain in five months and nine months worth of rain in five months, um, in, in maximum. Um, we had we had February as well. Um, so February we had on average 2.25 uh, times the average February's amount of rain fallen. And this was so much that Met Office actually had to change the scale on their, on their map. You'll see that it now goes up to four times the average rainfall in a month. And this was pretty much why, um, why February was the wettest February on record. And you, you, I tell you, if you went up to the Lake District or Yorkshire in February 2020, you'd have had, had a very wet time. Um, you can see that it's pinks and purples at three and a half to four times the amount of rainfall um, in Yorkshire and Cumbria. Um, move on to the next slide, please. Um, so, so all that goes to show is that um, in the southern region, there were pockets that had a significant amount of rain. And this is a roll-up map of winter 2020. And it highlights quite nicely uh, the areas of Edenbridge and East Grimsby that had um, over one and three quarters of their average amount of rain. Um, and that just goes to show that you, you sort of think that maybe our earthworks can take, um, take the rainfall that falls on them. But, but one and three quarters of the amount of rain is a significant amount of rain for our Victorian earthworks to take. They barely take the average amount of rainfall, let alone almost double the amount of rainfall that we see in the winter. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, but how it changes. Um, so you'll see that that incredible amount of rain in the winter then flipped completely into summer uh, from March time onwards. And those of you that are track engineers on the call will know that we had um, a huge amount of um, soil saturation issues in the summer, as in um, the soil definitely wasn't saturated, it was very dry, um, which caused tremendous amounts of track issues. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but now we flipped back completely the opposite way again. And you can see there October was an incredibly wet month. And now we seem to be back in, in some sort of normality in terms of our ground saturation. Um, but I think all this goes to show that the, the weather is changing, the climate is changing. We're flipping backwards and forwards from extremes uh, quite quickly. Uh, and I think all this goes to show that um, we need to be agile in our approach to managing our earthworks and our tracks. Uh, and to have some good plans in place to be able to respond to these particular locations. Uh, next slide, please, Colin. Trying to speed up a bit now. Um, so, how does the uh, dry weather impact on our earthworks? Well, many of you will know that um, a lot of our earthworks in the in Kent, Sussex, and Wessex are made of clay. Uh, that's the picture on the left-hand side. You'll you'll, you'll recognise uh, the track looking like that in very dry weather. Um, when you have um, very dry weather, very thirsty trees like that English oak tree. Um, again, it's another toxic mix which uh, you, which can cause track quality problems, and you'll see that um, colourful plot uh, quite commonly in network rail, which shows uh, super red over a quite long length, which just means that um, the track has gone off quite significantly. Um, what you will also see on that plot as well is that. Um, it, it, it starts and ends over a particular length, which is generally the length of the embankment. It might be a difference in geology as well. Um, but you'll also see a lot of seasonality in those movements as well. So um, just when you think you've got it back to a green, 
very good. Um, gradually, it will change over time to yellow, to blue, to red, to cyan um, during the season. So there's quite a good correlation between fat quality and um, soil saturation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm hoping that Colin will share this presentation with you later, and you, you can have a look at this slide in a bit more detail if, you, if you're not quite sure about um, how soil moisture deficit impacts on um, earthworks. But it, it goes to show um, that in some geologies, uh, when you have uh, some particular types of trees, primarily high water demand trees, and those being oak, poplar, ash, and willow, um, those trees pull a lot of water out of the earthworks. So it's not the not the heat of the sun so much; it's the uh, trees transpiring and losing water out of their leaves, drawing it up in their roots. That can pull water out of the clay earthwork. A bit like subsidence that we have next door to houses, uh, that causes the embankments to shrink. The track obviously goes with the embankment and can cause um, some quite significant uh, geometry issues. Next slide, please. Um, many of you will have seen these plots that we use within Network Rail. Um, we plot SMD over time. Um, so this one is showing. Um, between January and January along the bottom scale and SMD on the left hand side up to 300. Um, we have a, um, a, a, a weekly email that gets sent out with this information um, and you can click on the particular square that's relevant to you um, in terms of that top left hand plot. They're 40 kilometer squares um, and we're actually moving towards having information at five kilometer squares now. Um, and we are able to receive this information from the Met Office. Um, so they send it through to us weekly. And we're able to plot each one of these lines for each year. And what you can see quite nicely for the, um, the bold uh, orange line, the line which is quite clearly um, at the top um, of all others, is that uh, starting off from the 1st of January, it was, uh, it, it, it was right down the bottom on zero. The zero SMD means saturated. So that was obviously when we were having our earthworks problem and the land flip. Um, from um, the first and second week in March, um, it was like someone had turned off the tap and there was no, no rain from about March onwards. And you can see that the, the SMD line is climbing all the time, all the way through until um, August time. Um, we we had, did have some rainfall in August, thankfully, which stopped it from uh, going off the page and over 300. Um, but you'll see that um, it was certainly worse than the summer of 2018, um, and it was actually the worst uh, year for dry SMD um, of all of the years that we've been monitoring since 2009. Um, and thankfully, um, as I said, we had a we've had a wet October, and that's now start to pull it back down into that sort of mess of all the other lines. So now it would appear that we're, we're sort of normal and perhaps in a better position than 2018 when we had all the earthworks failures. As you, as you can see for 2018, the red line, um, at, at uh, this time of year, we were a lot, uh, a lot lower. Um, so uh, I guess in conclusion for this one, it, it shows that it can go from very saturated to very dry quite quickly. Um, and it's all about how we prepare uh, the railway for those uh, changes in, in soil moisture conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to do that, what we've done is um, issued some guidance on vegetation management on earthworks. Um, so you'll know that there are some network rail standards, 086 um, is one of those um, that gives some guidance on, on earthworks. Um, uh, and how vegetation can impact on them. Um, I've put together some, some regional guidance as well to try and um, just put it in one place for, for new starters um, and, and just to pick up on some of the, um, the history that, that, we've, that we've got and to try and share that. Um, so that is available for, for Network Rail staff if they're, if they're interested in it. Um, I think one of the challenges that we often find with tree removal is not only the ecological aspects of them now, um, it, it, uh, sometimes we, we get a bit concerned about taking too many trees off embankments 
and, and now we give guidance that we should really only be removing trees off the top third of, of embankments to try and strike the right balance between too wet and too dry. Um, and we have used selective removal as well for, for um, dry weather and wet weather management rather than do whole stretches of embankment. And that's just it's just the focus of swung back a little bit to trying to um, manage the biodiversity of our embankments, not removing trees. Um, public perception is that um, we should be maintaining those green corridors for the wider benefit of the country. Uh, and actually, Network Rail has signed up to some quite significant targets about um, net loss of biodiversity. So they've signed up to a target of no net loss of biodiversity by 2024, which means that if we cut down something, we've got to put it back. Um, and there's some, some clever equations that say that if you cut down a, a significantly sized oak tree, what you've got to put back in its place, because quite clearly you can't uh, put back a 200 year old oak tree. And you're going to have to put back something that's quite significant over a wide area. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on the railway, it can be um, outside of the railway, but, but either way, you need to uh, recompense for the uh, biodiversity that you've removed. Um, next slide, please. So I'm now going to tell you a bit about, um, and the next slide after that, a bit about weather resilience and climate change, and how um, how we try to pull some of the information together. So um, you might have heard of the UK um, Climate Impact Programme predictions that have been put together. Um, some of the some of this information is on the next slide, and I will I will show you that in a minute. But, but what we try to do in this particular document, which is the um, Southeast Group Weather Resilience and Climate Change Adaptation Plan. Um, so this is valid for CP6. We've, we've republished it in June 2020 um, to bring in some of the latest climate change predictions. Um, so it gives climate change predictions for things like rain and um, heat. Um, but it also gives predictions for the other weather types that affect running of the railway as well, like wind, snow, lightning, fog, um, frost and cold, um, and obviously adhesion as well. Um, so you can see from that graph, um, that's minute delay on the left hand side and, and years along the bottom axis. How, how, um, how significant the effects of weather can be on the railway. And you can see that year, 2013, 2014, and that was obviously one of the wet periods. It was also very stormy as well. Um, and I think if we've got the up-to-date um, uh, bar for 2019-20, you'd see quite a significant uh, peak uh, for uh, subsidence and, and flooding as well. Um, I think gone are the days where we see a lot of snow. You can see that those snowy years in 2008, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, we haven't really had a snowy winter for some time. 17, 18 was um, the last time we saw any snow. Um, uh, and on the next, if you go to the ne next slide, please, Colin, um, what it does is it shows you some of the predictions for uh, climate change. So um, the UK Climate in Impact Programme 09 and 18 is no, 2018 predictions are no different really to 2009 predictions. Um, they show an overall shift towards warmer. Uh, weather, um, so that's drier summers and wetter winters. Um, and the two plots show um, a change in temperature, and the, and the three different lines show uh, 2020, 2050, and 2080. So you can see by 2080, we can be expecting to see summer temperatures eight to nine degrees higher than they are at the moment. Um, and uh, the bottom plot shows rainfall, and precip precipitation as it calls it, um, and uh, three lines again, 2020, 2050, and 2080. Um, and as you can see there, um, winter precipitation increasing by about 40 to 60%, um, and summer precipitation quite significantly reducing um, by perhaps 20 to uh, 60%. Um, so, so more rain in the winter and less rain in the summer to go with those warmer winters um, and drier summer, hotter dry summer. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's in the weather resilience climate change plan. So, um, it has a has an introduction and an executive summary. Um, it tells you a little bit about 
um, the weather resilient climate change adaptation plan, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, has a vulnerability assessment and an impact assessment. Tells you a bit about what we're doing in the in the former southeast route, which is now Kent and Sussex route, part of, part of the southern region. Um, tells you a bit about management governance and how we how we're continually looking to uh, review the information and improve the plan. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so what we what we're trying to do is um, increase our understanding of climate change impacts, uh, working with the Met Office. Um, we've got a program of assessing and rejuvenating drainage, which many of you will know about. So that not only covers um, understanding where the drainage is, uh, carrying out drainage inspections, um, and that's not just a one-off exercise. These are repeat inspections. Uh, and then we'll then intelligently use that information to be able to target uh, the drainage that needs to be uh, fixed. And also assessing um, appropriate maintenance intervals as well for that drain. Uh, and best of all, it, I think it has now been widely recognised that drainage is one of the unloved assets of the railway, and it now finally appears to be being funded as well, which is which is good news. That uh, the CP6 settlement for Kent and Sussex for drainage, that was a five-year pot of money, was £34 million uh, to spend on drainage. So that's quite a significant amount of money, and that will obviously go some way towards. Uh, reducing some of the earthworks issues. Um, ensuring that high risk earthworks have suitable mitigation plans in place. Um, so that's not just about having plans in place, it's about um, uh, remediating them as well, removing them from our at risk list. Um, a program of sustainable line side management, which is what I was talking about. Um, so we'll do the 0 to 7 strip management, but in certain areas as well, uh, we'll be replanting trees or, or other types of vegetation. That's a project ongoing within Network Rail at the moment. Um, trying to mitigate some of the risks of poor track geometry during the summer um, by creating better track access and carrying out additional track maintenance. Um, working with key stakeholders and line side neighbours to share knowledge on climate trends and impacts. So we're certainly working with uh, Southampton University at the moment uh, to come up with better ways of dealing with um, dry weather issues. Um, and some of these. Um, elements also being included within our standards as well. So uh, in the drainage manual, which is the standard which controls drainage design, um, there is a um, what they call a design event. Um, so that's a, an uplift in uh, things like pipe size and capacity to try and combat some of these weather challenges in the future. So if you bear in mind that a culvert or a pipe might be in the ground for 60 years after it's, it's been put in, that culvert will be sized bigger to try and cope with some of these uh, increases in rainfall in the future. Um, and what we're trying to do across Network Rail as well, and it's not only um, at Edenbridge, um, as you saw, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a Boris term, it seems, isn't it? It's, it's built back better while we're there. Um, so certainly at Dawlish and at Conway Valley, uh, where similar events have occurred. Uh, we're building that better, trying to make the railway a bit more resilient um, whilst we're there and whilst it's closed. Next slide, please, Colin. So I think that's about it. So um, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I haven't kept an eye on the chat function, so um, I can see a one in the box. So maybe maybe someone's asked a question, but happy to take questions. Okay, Derek, that's, uh, that's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting to note, February 2020, four times the average rainfall, uh, making it the wettest on record. And I think your summary about drier summers and wetter winters, and that's going to get exaggerated as we go forward, is uh, certainly interesting. Um, we have a, a question um, from Phil Edwards. Uh, did the famous Lynn spout appear inside the Hamilton <laughs> Tunnel uh, in well, St. January this year due to the excessive rainfall? Yeah, so Phil, um, the Lydon spout doesn't come out of um, Abbotsford Tunnel in quite the way it used to. It used to come come out directly out of the brickwork. Um, I don't know whether you remember, probably about uh, 15 years ago, some work was done in um, in a number of the tunnels there is Harbour, Shakespeare and uh, Abbotscliffe to um, 
redo some of the tunnel linings, particularly in Abbott's case where the tunnel lining was um, was in quite a poor state. And actually, Lydon Spout was piped uh, outside of the tunnel lining. Um, so it now runs outside of the lining. Um, it runs underneath the track into a, um, into a, a it's effectively a culvert that goes underneath the track and then out through the adit. Um, and if you walk outside of Abbott's Cliff Tunnel, which you can do, um, there is a, you'll see Lydon, well, it's not the spout, but it's the stream that comes from the spout and it actually runs over the beach. And I remember walking around there in, in March of this year and the, the amount of water, it was a torrent coming out of the, of the side of the cliff. Um, uh, and we did have the tunnel checked just in case, but there was certainly a huge velocity of water coming out of um, out the Lydon spout. It, it's still running, but it doesn't it doesn't come out of the tunnel anymore, so the, the trains don't get a wash as they as they always used to. Um, it just comes out the side of the tunnel and into the sea. It's beautifully clear water, and we ought to be thinking about doing something with it, really. <laughs> yeah. Th thanks very much, Derek. Um, sorry, right. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, in my time down there, it used to literally pour out of the joints of the brickwork and the water right. was under so much pressure, it used to touch the sides of the brickwork on the other side of the tunnel. Um, and we had to use, usually had to put an emergency speed restriction on for, for a number of days uh, until, you know, it subsided. But yeah, I, I didn't realise that they'd done a lot of work to that. So yeah, it's yeah. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they called it the um, the trilogy because it was three tunnels um, and it was the line was closed for some some months I think where they sorted out those three tunnels. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question from Matthew Matthew Appleyard. Uh, with the prediction of more extreme seasons, it is good to see a focused stroke push on drainage. However, is there to be a consideration to rail stress in the future? A possible change in stressing methods or standards. Well, that might be something for, for the track engineers on the call to answer. Um, I, I believe they are talking about changing the um, the temperature that you stress rails to, and that would be sensible, wouldn't it, if the, if the temperature is going to be increasing? Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Jordan, for instance, you might might be a bit more familiar with that than I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, any imminent changes. Obviously, I'm a bit out of the uh, loop a little bit with re regards to uh, uh, current track discussions, but I, I think it's uh, highly likely there's going to be need, need to be changes in the future. Um, uh, from what you said, so I think you said eight to nine degrees uh, increase in air temperature in the summer. Um, yeah. We're kind of pushing it already now, aren't we? Or, or we need to think of uh, 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 additional things we can do to sort of add resilience to the uh, track assets. Uh, the, other, the other thing to say from my end is uh, I, I'm head of track on HS2 at the moment. Um, but I, I've been asked several times by uh, climate people um, whether the SFT stress-free temperature should be raised or higher because of climate change in the future, HS2. Um, and my stock answer to that tends to be if network rail change it in the southern region, because the temperature is generally higher in the south, um, then we would might might want to consider it and follow suit. But because our railway is more, more going towards the north, I'd be looking at network rail in the southern region first before we started considering increasing the SFT. But uh, yeah, so <laughs> be interested to know if that does change on network rail. Yeah. Um, I can answer, I can, Colin, I can answer Jordan's question about yes. um, what I'd like to see from PW engineers. Um, so I've mentioned about drainage. So, so it's a bit, bit of a quirk, isn't it, that, that drainage maintenance is still within the DU. Um, I, I, I guess I could uh, take that away from the DUs and, and manage it within my own team if I had the resource and, and the people well, the people and the money to do it. But at the moment, um, the route asset manager sets the targets for drainage um, and it's, sent, it's set quite scientifically in terms of the amount of um, route miles in each DU. 
Um, my, my plea would be that you maintain as much drainage as you can within the DU. Um, it, it's not a good look if you're behind target going into a winter. Um, and I think, think uh, when you look at the impact of Stonehaven um, in terms of uh, how critical it is to have functioning drainage, um, I, I think it, it, it's something that's a very, very easy win for us. It, as long as you know where the drainage is and you know it's in a lip. Um, so that's not only in terms of high speed one, but that's in terms of the classic railway as well, that maintaining drainage has really got to become a priority. Really. So that, that would be my plea. Um, Marcus's question, Marcus's question, shall I answer that? Yes, please. Um, to what ex for those of you that don't sit, to what extent is it possible to get ahead of earthworks failures being proactive instead of reactive? Yeah, that's a really good question, Marcus, and is is uh, something I, I'm really quite keen to do, and something that uh, it's easy to look back on the winter that we had and perhaps say that we we never end up doing that. But but what goes behind all of those reactive failures is probably double uh, the number of proactive fixes that I haven't told you about, um, and that we know that um, if we if we are extensively inspecting and monitoring our earthworks, we're forming a a work bank of locations that that could fail in the future, perhaps within the next two, three, four, five years. If we can get to those failures, get to those locations before they fail and fix them in advance. Um, then that will gradually whittle down the at-risk location. Um, as, I, as I showed you on that Times article, we never, we will never um, stop all failures from happening. But if we start at the top and work our way down um, on a risk basis, um, we'll at least remove the locations, perhaps on the busiest lines, um, the lines where a derailment might be quite catastrophic. Um, uh, we will never get rid of all the all the failures on some of the little lines, but at least we'll we'll start um, with the major lines. And the way to do that is um, to allow enough time to develop to investigate those locations with monitoring, uh, do ground investigation, do appropriate design and fix them. Uh, the the planned uh, fixes for earthworks can take anywhere from three to five years, so um, it, it's not quick and you need stable amounts of funding and expert engineers within within my team to locate the locations and, and progress the work. But so it's, an, it's an ongoing battle, but it's not, not beyond us at all. Good stuff. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. So Derek, thank you for me. If I can ask Jordan just to do the voter thanks. Yeah, I'll just say one more question come through. So I don't know if you want to take that one, Colin, can we? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, it says, uh, this is from Jonathan Wright. What is the biggest challenge to completing to do this? Is it money, access, time, or business support? What would you say, Derek? Um, I think one of the challenges at the moment is um, uh, so we, I would have said the amount of money at the moment is is, is adequate to do the job. Um, what we tend to find is that, that money can be switched off and turned on quite quickly, um, and contractors can't uh, can't build their organisations that quickly. So, so a stable amount of funding that either that gradually ramps up. Um, so rather than perhaps having a five-year strategy, having a 10 or a 15-year strategy for earthworks is, is a good thing, um, bearing in mind what I said about developing jobs in quite a long, long time. Um, the BAM is our framework contractor in the southeast and Osborne in Wessex. Um, and it takes three to four years for them to be able to build their team uh, to be able to spend multi-million of pounds. Um, which they which they are doing to reflect the increased funding in earthworks. So uh, and it will only be more funding because of Stonehaven as well. Um, so CP7, I can see that our earthworks funding will go up by about 40%. Um, uh, so so certainly funding has something to do with it. Contractors' ability has something to do with it. Um, you might be aware that geotechnical engineers are quite in quite short supply as well across the country. We're on the 
what's called the tier two shortage provisions list, um, which means that you can recruit from outside of um, the UK quite easily. Um, so I think some development of, of geotechnical engineers would be helpful within the country. Perhaps not too relevant for, for some of you because you're PW engineers, but I know there's a couple of geotechnical engineers on the call. Um, so that, that means things like um, a more degree courses in universities, and um, we tend to find that, or well, you know, that high speed two is being built at the moment. So that, that will have sucked away quite a lot of the geotechnical engineering resource from, uh, from network rail. A um, uh, couple of the other things, access. Um, most of our geotechnical um, earthworks work is, is done with trains running. So that's not too much of an issue. Drainage is a bit different. We could always do with more drainage access, uh, particularly for relaying track drainage. Um, yeah, so so those are a couple of the things that I think we need to uh, we need to improve on. Good stuff, thank you, Derek. Uh, Jordan, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Colin, and uh, and thanks, Derek. Uh, a really uh, great presentation there, and uh, uh, quite a sort of a coup for us to get the uh, uh, regional geotech engineer to give up some of his time and uh, present to us. I, I can see on the call here we've got a number of uh, track engineers, and we've also got uh, some track apprentices as well. So a, a really good opportunity to to uh, hear from a, a really uh, well-respected and experienced uh, person for for the region and uh, you know some fantastic content there in terms of uh, uh, some photos from the uh, early embankments and construction methods and also uh, you know I, I, I really enjoyed seeing the historical uh, um, uh, paper extracts of the uh, slips at Stonehaven, uh, Waterhouse and, uh, and Dawlish and, uh, and I think it's a uh, uh, a really important message that there's always more to do. So uh, these uh, over history, these things uh, tend to repeat themselves, and uh, there'll always be more to do. And, and quite, uh, you know, an eye opener. The number of uh, lamb slips over the last uh, year or so. I think you said it was over 50 for for Kent and Sussex. And I uh, uh, and I remember watching the uh, control extracts come in and seeing uh, you and your team being called out during those uh, wet weather seasons almost continuously and uh, and also flicking over the news and seeing you on the ITV and then flicking over and see you on the I'm pretty sure I saw you on the BBC straight afterwards as well so uh, uh, yeah you did um, um, <laughs> you did unfortunately yes. you should you should have turned on to channel four <laughs> <laughs> so some uh, and that, that was at Eden Bridge and uh, and I think it's really important uh, as a track engineer myself uh, myself to uh, uh, to acknowledge the part that the 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 the, the uh, making you know we're often the first responders and the, and the people that notice uh, uh, the the the, the, the um, the, the sort of triggers and the the things that we can first identify uh, uh, failures, but um, yeah, I, I, I know from working with you over a number of years that you've got uh, quite a small team and a significant challenge to manage all of the the, the reason the region's uh, geotech assets. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to to say uh, thanks again for your time. Uh, really appreciated, and it kind of feels like. Uh, uh, you could have done another couple of hours of uh, talk, so uh, I'm hoping uh, uh, some stage in the future we'll be able to get you back to to do another talk on uh, uh, some, some, something similar, but uh, a little bit different as well. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, John. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that, uh, Derek. Uh, and just on closing, obviously, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, our next meeting, obviously, once again, will be held virtually on Tuesday the 8th of December and John Dolan will be presenting his paper on infrastructure asset management so it looks to be another great uh, paper in the meantime stay safe and thanks once again bye